Welcome to this Candidates Forum. It's co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Winnebago County, of Appleton, Esther, and the City of Nina. This event is being recorded and can be accessed at lwvwinnebago.org, which is the League of Women Voters website, your Spectrum Community Channel, and at the City of Nina's site. I'm Margie Davey, President of the League of Women Voters of Winnebago County, your moderator tonight. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government. Our mission is to inform citizens about major public policy issues and about candidates seeking office. We do not support or oppose any political party or any candidate. Wisconsin Senate District Number 19 includes Assembly Districts 55, 56, and 57, which include Appleton, the part of Menasha that's not in Calumet County, Nina, Winnicani, Larson, Greenville, Fox Crossing, and sort of everything in between. Roger Roth, the Republican Party incumbent, and Lee Snodgrass, the Democratic Party challenger, are both asking for your vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Candidates, our timekeepers give you your clues. Can you raise your hand, please, timekeeper? Thank you for keeping your answers short so that we may cover as many issues as possible. If you go over, I may have to stop you. Um, audience, your questions are welcome, and I know you've had plenty of time to submit many already. We thank you for that. Um, if you have more, you can submit them to league representatives. Just raise your hand and somebody will, will bring you what you need for that or pick up your question. Um, your question must be for both candidates, and we reserve the right to re to reword questions for clarity and brevity. Audience response, either positive or negative, is discouraged. We wish to get to as many questions as possible in an effort to help voters learn about as many issues as possible. So please remain respectful. And with that, we will have our three minute opening statements from each of the candidates. Tell us about your qualifications and why you are seeking election or re-election to the Wisconsin State Senate. And going alphabetically, we'll start with Roger Roth. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the League for putting this event together. Each and every election cycle, they do this for the benefit of all voters and all citizens. So thank you for putting this together. I want to thank the City of Nina for opening up their chamber here for us to gather here. I want to thank all of you who've taken times out of your day to come and listen to Lee and I talk about issues that are important <coughs> to us here as citizens of Wisconsin. And I'd like to finally thank uh, Major League Baseball. They have decided to make it a traveling day for the Brewers, so we don't have to split our attentions here. So I am Senator Roger Roth. I represent this area currently in the state legislature. I certainly would appreciate your support here for another four years. My background, I am a third generation home builder. My father taught me the profession of home building that he learned from his grandfather. And that really gives me the experience when I'm down in Madison, I understand how government can help and how it can hurt our small businesses. And I take that experience with me to Madison each and every day. I'm also a member of the 115th Fighter Wing in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a public affairs officer there. And I can tell you that nowhere in my life have I received training in terms of leadership like I have in serving with the military. And I think that serves me well when I'm down in Madison working with a diverse group of individuals, representing a diverse group of individuals here in the 19th Senate District to really work to spearhead legislation and get things done. And then finally, I'm the current state senator, was elected in 2014. And two years ago, I was honored to be chosen by the Senate as a whole. The Republicans and Democrats unanimously selected me to serve as the Senate president of that body, which brings with it leadership and also uh, it's a presiding officer of the Senate. And I, I like to think that they picked me because they knew I was an impartial and independent voice. That is something I've prided myself on, being able to listen to people of all different beliefs and then work to uh, for them in Madison, and it's something that I will continue to do if chosen by you to be your state senator moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, go ahead. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I also want to thank both uh, the League of Women Voters of Winnebago and Outagamie County and the participating organizations for hosting this tonight. Um, I am one of these people who gets really, really excited about the democratic process, and to see so many people here tonight engaged and taking the time to sit and listen to us and be informed about your vote uh, is really gratifying. Um, my name is Lee Snodgrass, and I am running to be, hopefully, your next state senator in beautiful District 19. 
Um, I have lived in Appleton for 24 years. I've raised my family here in the area, um, and, and I uh, love uh, this part of Wisconsin. Um, I have a daughter, Nora, who is going to college right now in Minnesota, and a son, Henry, who's sitting right in the front row here, who goes to school in Appleton. I'm enormously proud of them, and I look forward to, um, to, to serving them as well as their constituents. Um, I wanted to also just let you know that I got here to um, Wisconsin via the paper industry. My family moved to Green Bay when I was 10. Um, my father worked for uh, Scott Paper Company at the time, and he took a job at James River Paper. And paper has been uh, part of our family history, part of our lore. I, I started out working in a paper mill one summer in college, and then I eventually built my career working in paper for Fox River Paper Company, which was located in Appleton before it sailed in Nina Paper. Um, so I acutely understand some of the needs of the district, I think, uh, particularly now. Um, I also um, want to talk about how, why I'm running. Um, one of the reasons that I am running is that I don't feel that the people of Wisconsin are being represented right now um, in a way that the most people are doing well. Um, I think that we have forgotten that government is supposed to be of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we need, get, need to get back to a place where government is providing those building blocks, not handouts, but building blocks for everybody to have the opportunity for success. And that, to me, looks like strong public schools, that looks like uh, affordable health care that looks like opportunities to be successful economically. Now, I have worked um, here in the communications field. I'm currently the communications director at Girl Scouts of the Northwestern Great Lakes. And through my service at Girl Scouts, and our mission is to build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And I find that right now that this is certainly a time for that. Um, and I would like to take some of the values that I learned on the job uh, in the way I've raised my children, the way I was raised, and what we do with the Girl Scouts, and apply those to government. Um, I'm hoping to be able to serve you uh, in government, and I'm hoping to be able to learn and listen from the constituents, because I feel that I am one of you. Um, I think far too often right now, government in Madison is out of touch with the needs of working people. I'm a single parent. I work full time. I am doing just everything that you're trying to do to make ends meet. And I would love an opportunity to be able to be your representative voice in Madison. Thank you, Lee. OK. Is this still working? OK. <laughs> it sounds the same to me either way, so I can't tell. Um, the first question that I have for each of you, and we will have Lee answer this first. If you were the Senate Majority Leader, what would you work hard to change? And for these questions, we have one minute. Wow, if I were the Senate Majority Leader, one of the first things that I would want to do is make sure that um, our district maps are redrawn. Um, I think right now, we have a situation where um, votes are working for politicians rather than the other way around. And I, for one, am happy to work for votes. I am happy to work um, to, to earn your vote. And I don't think that maps should be skewed one way or the other to favor one party or the other. I would also pay attention to public education. Um, I think we need to make sure that we get back to a strong public education system instead of supporting two systems. So that would definitely be a priority, priority for me. Um, I also would make sure that we immediately take the Medicaid expansion so that we have access to affordable health care for everybody in Wisconsin, uh, something that should have been done and can very easily be done now, saving taxpayer dollars and covering more people and making sure that more people have good health care in Wisconsin. So those are my top three. Thank you. Roger? I don't think I'd want to be the Senate Majority Leader, to be quite honest with you. That is a tough job. And I will, t you know, we're going to talk about the issues moving forward here tonight and where we are on either side of them. But really, when you look at the Senate Majority Leader, their job is to build consensus, not just within the ruling party, which right now is Republicans, but also to work with the minority leader in the minority party. And it's a very difficult job because you've got 33 senators who are down there who come from 33 different parts of the state who all have different ideas of how, govern how government can help and hurt people and different priorities and what those should be. So I guess I would try my hardest in being that independent voice to work closely with members of my own caucus and at the same time reach out to those on the other side of the aisle because what we need, not just in Wisconsin, but what we need in this country is for Republicans and Democrats to kind of lay down the rhetoric and come together for the good of the people. You elect us to govern. Thank you. OK, next question. This one goes to Roger first. 
What criteria should the state use in deciding whether to grant tax incentives to industries for saving jobs or creating new jobs? Uh, we certainly have done that a few times here, and I will speak specifically to Kimberly Clark. I don't think you can, you have to almost look at these all independently because, you know, a company like Foxconn, and I think we'll probably have a question on it, so I'm going to save talking about that for a moment, but a, question, a company like Foxconn or Kimberly Clark, the ability, what can they do to generate and improve the economy in a community? Kimberly Clark has the potential. This is an anchor business within an anchor industry. They have a supply chain of 237 Wisconsin companies. They procure $52 million in goods and services from Wisconsin each and every year. They're a good corporate citizen here in the Fox Valley, donating $4 million a year to the United Way, the largest donor in our local area to the United Way. And if we're able to put this deal together, they're going to put a potential half billion dollar investment in that facility moving forward. It will be a boom for Northeast Wisconsin in every job up and down that supply chain. So you look at it independently, each of these, and you recognize that this is an important thing to do for our area. Thank you. Lee, I'm going to read the question again for you. What criteria should the state use in deciding whether to grant tax incentives to industries for saving jobs or creating new jobs? Well, the first thing I would do, speaking of bipartisanship, is to invite uh, the opposing party to the table. Um, the Kimberly-Clark bill was written without the input of Democrats. Um, they were not at the table. They were not part of the discussion. So I think if we're talking about bipartisan leadership, we need to have a comprehensive picture about what everybody thinks is best for the taxpayers. Um, I also think that it's, it's, we get to be in a difficult situation. I think Kimberly Clark is an amazing corporation. I used to do consulting for them. My children's father used to work for them. Um, certainly we don't want to see them leave. But it's difficult when we have a profitable corporation um, who um, we're offering tax incentives to. I have uh, worked in the paper industry before. I could have told you in 1999 that the paper industry was changing, the supply demand was changing, and that we were going to see some losses. Um, and I think that we should have invested in some of the paper companies that have already gone out of business, um, who were not profitable, who went into receivership. Um, and at the time, um, you know, those things were happening. I don't, I don't know where, um, where Madison politicians were at that point. So um, I, I'm sure we're going to have another question on this, but I think we need to look, make sure taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. Thank you. Okay, this question will go to Lee first. Um, and I forgot to mention, these are audience questions that I'm working off of now. So if you submitted one that sounds close, it's because we maybe got three or four questions that were all very, very similar, so we kind of combine them. Um, this one regard is regarding dark store loopholes. You may have heard of this. It's something that's on the Winnebago County ballot um, for all of us. And the question it has a yes or no answer on the ballot. Um, do you support or oppose closing the dark store loophole? Um, I support closing the loophole. And I'm disappointed that when given the opportunity, um, Senator Roth did not close it last session. Um, I, I'm sure you're probably aware that Senator Roth authored the legislation to close that loophole um, and then was unable to, or actually it w came up for a vote and he, he, he took it away. So he, he took it away from being able to be voted on. Um, I believe that that happened because of pressure from um, large business lobby like WMC. Um, I think at this point we now know what this is going to cost individual homeowners and small businesses and shifting that burden uh, to them is unfair and we need a politician who's going to stand up to special interests and to look out for the individual homeowners and small businesses in doing that. Um, and I think that uh, when Roger had the opportunity, he did not do it and now he's campaigning on being the person to do it next session and as I tell my children, um, actions speak louder than words. Thank you. Roger? Thank you. I am the author of the, of the Dark Store Loophole Fix, and I'm proud to be the author. This idea, this legislation came to me because I sat down with Mayor Tim Hanna and Town Chairman Dave Schwalter in Grand Chute, and they walked me through the problems that they were having with the exploitation of this loophole. The reason this is so important, this is a property tax issue. No one has done more over the last eight years to lower your property taxes than Governor Walker and the Republican-controlled legislature. But now if we don't fix this loophole, what you're going to see is the commercial class uh, uh, the commercial class and what they pay in taxes will go down and it'll be, have to be shifted. It'll have to go to the residential class because communities have fixed costs. Now, the reason that we weren't able to pass it this time is because a number of people had issues. I had small businesses 
reach out to me. Not the big box store retailers, they'll never support this, but the mom and pops who had particular issues with market segmentation, with assets being inextricably tied to the property with highest and best use. That's why I've put together a legislative council study committee that as we speak is working through those ideas to come to some common ground so in January we'll be able to move forward quickly on this legislation. Thank you. Okay, this question goes to Roger first. Um, it's regarding immigrants. How will you lead us in making Wisconsin a more welcoming place for refugees, immigrants, and migrant workers? And the second part of this question, so let's give them a minute and a half, Posey, okay? Um, what is your stance on driver's cards for our undocumented when at least other 12 state, uh, when at least 12 other states have them? So, thank you. So we do have a, a problem with immigration in our country. The problem is our federal government has failed to act. The federal government is the charging authority in protecting our nation's borders. And honestly, what I don't understand, and maybe you, but what I don't understand is why Congress can't both secure the border and then let in any able-bodied person who can pass a background check, who's got skills, who can walk into the 90,000 plus jobs we have available right now in Wisconsin. I don't know why they can't do that. It's not being done right now. But until that happens, immigration policy, that has to be set by the federal government. We can't have 50 individual states doing their own thing. And we have to, they have the power and we have to respect that. I continue to encourage our legislative leaders in Washington to come up with a fix on this. So I don't support giving driver's license to undocumented workers. That undermines our immigration laws. We need to fix this at the front end in Washington because we need the workers. We quite honestly need the workers. Secure the border and then let folks in. And I think you'll find in our area, we've actually been very supportive of refugees. I think that was part of the question, what we do with, with, uh, to support refugees. And America has always been a place where we welcome people from around the world, particularly political refugees who are facing hardship in their own countries. I th and a lot of them are settled right here in Wisconsin, in Oshkosh, Nina, Appleton. I think that's a great thing. I think the more diversity in our area only makes us stronger, only makes us better. Thank you. Lee? Um, yes, I think there's several things that we can do um, that we're not doing, and I don't think that it, we necessarily have to wait for the federal government to figure out um, how to control our borders or what's happening at the borders. Um, I don't know if people here realize how many um, uh, how many immigrants own businesses, particularly in this community, and how they economically give back to our community. Um, when you take a look at um, certain fields, whether it be agriculture or um, you know, palliative care, we have a number of, of immigrants and refugees working and we need to make sure um, that they have a way to get to their job. And I understand that right now the, the, the real ID is prohibiting them from at times getting a driver's license, but we can offer a driver's card or a driving certificate. This would keep roads safe. It would, it would enable them to be insured. It would enable them to be trained to learn how to drive. And in states where they've done that, they've seen a reduction in hit and runs and things like that. And I think if we are saying that there is a job shortage, we need to make sure that people can get to jobs. And immigrants are here and ready to work and work hard and contribute to our communities and our society. And we need to make it easier for them to do it, not harder. Um, I also think it's, it, you know, we need to provide a, a opportunity for education and skills training. And one of those ways that we can do that is allow them to have um, in-state tuition if they decide they want to go to one of our wonderful technical schools or colleges. We should be able to grant that as well um, to them. And I think in general, just being a welcoming community means a community that is uh, embracing diversity and, and where we don't have students uh, going to school afraid that they or their parents are going to be um, taken at some point um, um, from, their, from their dwellings. Thank you. Okay, segueing to something else. <laughs> For farmers, the, soul, the soil is the foundation of their livelihood. However, surface runoff from farmers and residents impacts water quality of groundwater and our local waterways, like the Fox Wolf watershed, balance these vital interests. And that was the submitted question, but I would also add, how do you um, justify relocating wetlands as part of that question also. And we will start, this, who started last time? Can't remember either? Okay, let's start with Roger. Oh, so it's Lee this time? They know. That's They're keeping track. Thank you, appreciate that. Lee, go ahead. All right, as long as the timer didn't start yet. Um, <laughs> 
Um, yes, I, I think that this is incredibly important. You know, everybody who lives in this area has probably seen the, the, the algae blooms that were on uh, Lake Winnebago and how that impacted us. And, um, you know, part of the question was wetlands. Um, you guys may be aware that Roger also authored some legislation which um, declassifies a certain portion of Wisconsin's protected wetlands and allows you to fill and build on them without a permit. Um, I think that we have seen, and, we, and, and if you do any reading on wetlands, you know that wetlands are a natural filter, a pollution filter, and a sponge. And um, they are there for a reason. And when you fill them up and put a fake one somewhere else, it doesn't do the same job. Um, so we need to make sure that we are protecting uh, that for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of our, you may notice that we have a tremendous amount of climate change happening. And we're going to continue to have uh, different um, weather systems impacting the amount of rain that comes here. And if we do not have wetlands in place, if we keep filling and building on top of them, we're really going to struggle. Um, in terms of water quality in general, um, I think we need to be working with, with with, with agriculture and making sure that we're finding ways that they are um, uh, adhering to practices that reduce runoff that will get into our lakes and streams and water because obviously uh, water is literally life and we need to make sure that we are prioritizing um, environmental protections and frankly allowing local communities to do what they can uh, to put things in place to uh, prevent this from happening as well. Roger. Thank you. I, uh, this last session, uh, one of the largest reforms that I was able to work on dealt with wetlands. And we were able to take a, a, a situation in our state right now where we didn't have, we want to protect the environment and yet at the same time, uh, the way our policies that we have in place right now are counterintuitive to it. So what we're actually doing is we're forcing businesses to go and gobble up pristine farmland outside of our communities because inside our industrialized areas there might be a wetland, there might be an artificial wetland. Appleton had an instance where they were driving, they had, a, uh, they had an industrial park, they were driving their trucks into dump snow because during the recession they weren't able to build it up and uh, lo and behold they had um, those, those those ruts had indicators of wetland and they didn't let them develop on it. So we fixed that. We want, in, in the way we did it, is we want development to happen within incorporated areas. So if it's happening within an incorporated area, if your area already has a, a wastewater, a sewer system, a stormwater sewer system, we allow you then to fill in wetlands there and then what that does is you're able to go in the in outside to build pristine wetlands um, these are the, in, in not just building new ones, but also growing and expanding existing ones right now because wetlands are very important. But what we were able to do here was to curtail urban sprawl, keep development within communities, and protect our farmlands in rural areas from needless development. Thank you. Okay, this time it's Roger first. Am I correct? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, about infrastructure, it's vital for the state's economy and the safety of its citizens. What is the state's role in funding projects? So I'm just going to assume we're going to talk about transportation infrastructure here. Sure, let's um, go for that. Okay, so uh, the state has a vital role in in our transportation infrastructure. Now, the funding sources for our transportation comes from a mix of uses. It comes from federal dollars, it comes from state dollars, and it comes from local dollars. But particularly the state's dollars, we have a, a, a instance right now where I think we can all recognize we've got to find some new revenue sources for transportation. But before I'm willing to go and inject new revenues into the transportation fund, I wanted to make sure two things happen, and both of them are being done. First, I wanted to make sure that the money we are already allocating to transportation fund is being spent wisely. So the state, we commissioned an audit, the Joint Audit Committee in the legislature, and we identified several hundred million dollars in savings within the Department of Transportation. That is a significant portion of money. $150 million buys you a bypass of Hortonville out in western Outagamie County. So that's not, that's not chump, uh, couch cushion change, that's important. And so we were able to do that. That's the first step. Secretary Ross, secondly, he's implementing something called replace in kind. So we have instances where we're over engineering projects right now and we're adding unnecessary costs to projects. And he is working that back right now too. So our money is being spent wisely. And then thirdly, then we come to what kind of, what should we do as a state to find out whatever that difference is in injecting revenues. 
The only thing I don't support is a gas tax because a gas tax doesn't get at the core of our problem. Vehicles are becoming more and more efficient every day. People are driving hybrids more and more every day using so, uh, so, uh, totally electric vehicles. So we have to find a funding source that ties the vehicles driven, the amount that you drive your vehicle, to uh, the amount that's paid in. Thank you. Lee? Well, this is probably the one thing that people on the doors agree on, is that our roads are terrible and we need to do something about it. Um, there is a campaign called Just Fix It, and I really think it should be called Just Fund It. Um, we have gotten to a point where roads are literally being uh, crumbling and going into gravel without repair. Um, so being 49th worst road quality in the nation is not a place we should be. Uh, Governor Walker has had uh, ex-transportation secretaries uh, even come out and say that we are doing um, uh, irresponsible borrowing um, on the debt here um, to pay for roads. So um, I believe that the state does have a responsibility um, uh, to fund it. And I think any um, conversation about it also needs to include, at this point, other sources of revenue. Now, um, if, if you guys are paying attention to the radio, I'm sure there, you're hearing attack ads on, on anybody who's running for, for, um, on the Democratic ticket about the, some exorbitant tax that we're going to give you. Um, we used to index the gas tax to inflation. I think that's something that we need to bring back. Roger's right that it's not going to um, cover the entire gap. So we could look at small things. And when I say look at, I mean have difficult conversations and work with people to find out what the actual financial impact would be on individuals um, on everything from a, a very small modest increase perhaps in registration fee. But I also want to say that any comprehensive discussion about transportation really needs to include public transportation and that's often left out of the equation. Um, I would be a huge champion of regional transit authorities like Senator Mike Ellis was at one time and I think we need to bring back that discussion as well. Thank you. And that gave me the perfect segue for our next question, which is on public transportation. Um, this is a submitted question, and it has options. <laughs> public transportation provides an important connection to jobs, health care, and other services for a growing number of Wisconsinites, especially for an aging population, people with disabilities, and people who prefer public transportation. And might I mention it's also a lot more sustainable. Reduced or very flat investments over the past decade have made it difficult to meet unmet needs of transit riders. Which of the following transportation proposals do you support? Legislation that authorizes regional transportation authorities. Choosing to fix existing roads first instead of adding new highway expansions. Enacting the recommendations for public transportation funding from the governor's 2013 Transportation Finance and Policy Commission. And we will go with Lee first. That is very specific. Am I supposed to choose between those three or which one I would do first or at all? I'm not, okay. Whatever you'd like to okay. tell us. Um, well, I, I, you just heard me say that I would be in support of a regional transit authority, which would allow um, larger municipalities like Appleton or Nina to um, pair their resources so that um, other areas which uh, where transportation, public transportation does not yet go to um, could be funded and we can get people from A to B more easily and there would be more options for them. Um, when we were talking before about ways to also make our town more welcoming to immigrants, um, this is another problem. Um, a lot of immigrants um, work jobs where the bus line does not go out to or the bus line stops at 11 o'clock at night and they have to get off their ship. So this is a, you know, transportation, like many, many things, um, is linked to many broader issues. Um, so I definitely think that is something that had bipartisan support before. I think it's a conversation that we need to start again. Again, these are going to be difficult conversations where we have to come to some sort of compromise and agreement. Um, we may not always agree, but those conversations need to start. And right now, that's not happening in Madison. Roger? I think I support all of the things you talked about there, but let me just talk about regional transit authorities. Um, I absolutely support that. I think that it is imperative that we have one here for the Fox Valley. Now, it's not as imperative as it had been a couple of years ago because then Congressman Reed Ribble was able to put in a fix at the federal level, which, and it was all based on population. When the communities crossed a threshold, then we lost federal funding. He was able to raise that threshold. So we thank him for what he did, but yet it, by taking away the urgency, I wonder if that took away the, the pressure and the urgency to 
really move it forward and get it done. I think it's important that we do it because there is nothing more conservative than the people in an area paying for their transportation system. It doesn't make sense to me that we would borrow money from China, wash it through the federal government to pay for our buses here in Nina, Appleton, Menasha, and so forth. And plus, with the way our busing system is set up, we're not like Milwaukee or a large metropolitan area where one uh, city the bus system operates within that. What we have here is a conglomeration of many different municipalities, cities, towns, villages, and right now, I, we got to thank the city of Appleton. They've been very, uh, they've been very patient, I think, and very forthright working with their neighbors oh, to uh, Valley Transit work. But I think even they would agree if we had a regional transportation system where there was buy-in from all those communities, it would actually work in the best interest of our constituent. Thank you. Okay, let's segue to something else. And this goes to Roger first. In the state of Wisconsin, public health departments are required to provide nursing services, prevent illness, respond to health threats, and promote health. According to America's health ranking in 2017, the state of Wisconsin ranks 47th in combined state and federal public health funding per capita. Given this lack of funding for public health in Wisconsin, how will you, as an elected official, prioritize funding so public health can do what works best, prevent disease and health-related threats? Sure. I think uh, any conversation around expenditures, um, future expenditures in the budget, need to be taken in totality with the entirety of the state budget. So that is something, as we move forward in the next budget process, we're going to have to prioritize that with all the other pressures that we have in our state budget, whether it be transportation, or education, we, or corrections, whatever it is, we have to fight for those dollars. And I've done, I like to think anyway, that I've done a pretty good job listening to people who have come to my office with particular needs. And I would encourage you as we move forward, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of spending, you know, making sure that they have the resources that they need. But again, it's hard to say, yes, let's do that now, not knowing what that would do to the rest of the budget. But it's important, if this is an issue that's important to you, that in the next budget process, you stay engaged on it so that myself and other legislators can look at that and make sure that it has that priority and the emphasis that it needs. Thank you. Lee, how would you prioritize funding so public health can do what works best? Uh, well, for one, I would show up at um, county budget meetings and um, learn about their struggles in that area. Um, I know that um, both Winnebago and Outagamie County have been having meetings, and this has been top of mind for them of how many um, unfunded mandates there are from the state to provide um, public health services um, with the inability to properly fund it. Um, so I think that when you talk about budget priorities, you know, in this last budget, we sure found a lot of money to give to, um, to a foreign corporation, and I would have preferred that we were actually investing in care and concern for people here in our area um, who are experiencing health con concerns. Um, and if you think about it, even from a financial standpoint, I mean, uh, preventative care is um, probably one of the best ways to prevent um, uh, added expenses to, to anybody's personal situation or even um, any local municipality. If we can make sure that people have access to adequate health care, they can make sure that they are addressing things before they become an, a problem for them, um, then we're all going to be better off if we can make that investment. Thank you. OK, this one goes to you first, Lee. A paid family leave bill has been introduced the past three legislative sessions. No action was taken. Do you support paid family leave? A hundred percent do I support paid family leave. Um, we are in a situation now where we have um, uh, an aging uh, population, where we have workers who are um, not just taking time off for um, taking care of um, new additions to their home, but they're taking care of um, sick and ailing parents um, or others in their family. Uh, we need to make sure that um, the people who are sometimes the most financially at risk for taking time off of work are protected um, and being able to take that time to provide compassionate uh, care for their family and their loved ones. Um, so I would absolutely support paid family leave. I think this is part of a, a broader way of making sure that the average working Wisconsinite has ways to reduce expenses. We know that we're in a situation where we have stagnant wage growth right now. Wages are not keeping pace with the expenses that we're all experiencing. And this would be one way to provide some financial security for people who do need to take that time off uh, to take care of loved ones, whether it be a, 
a newborn baby or a, an, an aging parent. Thank you, Roger. I support the family medical leave that, in fact, Wisconsin has one of the strongest ones in the nation. So the, the current laws we have it, I think is working quite well. Um, the trouble with, with, with expanding that um, beyond what we have now already is that it really puts a burden. I mean, think of, I don't know those of you who in the room here who might be employers, but it, with, with an economy the way it is, as hot as it is, growing as fast as it is, with workers in such demand as they are, to have a system in place where they can just up and leave and then the company's left straddling trying to find out how to fix that, I think that becomes a, a, a quite a burden on these businesses. Now, in certain instances, we do have that, and I, in the current regards it is right now, I fully support it. When my wife gave birth to our first, our second, and our third child, it absolutely was a godsend that we had laws in place that allowed her to stay home for three months to work and nurse with a child before she went back to work. And, and so I support what we have right now, but anything we look to expand it, I think there are ways we can do that and work with businesses to try and get them to find a way that they can implement things on their end which help out their employees. I don't know if that's something we need to mandate from the state. Okay, thank you. And back to you, I guess. Um, Wisconsin has more jobs than workers, both skilled and unskilled. What can the legislature do to help? What policies should the state adopt to attract, retrain, or keep the needed employees? And should there be a minimum wage increase? Let me take the last first. Uh, we don't need a minimum wage increase. You can, I was just seeing, um, you can, they're, they're hiring dishwashers at $16 an hour. And I think that's fantastic. The, the pro, the, one of the benefits of having 90,000 jobs, one of the benefits of having 90,000 jobs, Please. yeah, one of the benefits of having 90,000 jobs available right here in Wisconsin is it brings that upward pressure on wages. And now businesses are competing amongst one another for labor. So I think, um, uh, I apologize, I, I missed the, I lost my train of thought there. The I other understand. two parts of the question. Um, what policies should the state adopt? Oh, yes, I adopt? got it. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Yes. So uh, we are growing, so what we need to do in Wisconsin, we, we've, first of all, going back to the immigration thing, federal government needs to fix immigration because you can't fix the problem we have in our country. Our economy is growing so fast. In Wisconsin, it's growing, it's so robust that we can't fix it just with the people that we have here. We need them to fix the immigration system so we can bring people into our country to fill these jobs. But there are things we can do. You know, we have a 3% unemployment rate. It's a record in the state, seven months in a row, 3% are under. And what we need to be doing is working with uh, in our welfare programs and our entitlement programs to help people who are on government assistance right now work themselves into a family supporting job. That's where government can help. We've done that in this past session. We brought some welfare reform bills that we've passed. There's more we can do because we haven't totally erased what they call the benefit cliff, which oftentimes prohibits people. They want to go out there. They want to take on that next job. But if they do, they lose their health benefits. And that's where if we can work that into a, a, a slope as opposed to a cliff, we will better be able to help people work themselves into the workforce. And then, they're not our, then the government saves money. Thank you. Lee? Could you read the question again? I would be happy to. Wisconsin has more jobs than workers, both skilled and unskilled. What can the legislature do to help? What policies should the state adopt to attract, retrain, or keep the needed employees? And should there be a minimum wage increase? Um, yes, I would support a minimum wage increase. Um, the minimum wage in Wisconsin has um, remained at 725 since 2009. Um, and even red states that are uh, very conservative Republican have already raised their minimum wage. Um, I think it needs to be incremental. We need to be careful that you know we're not um, creating situations where businesses are un unable to support that. Um, but I recently read that an increase of um, ten dollars and ten cents would um, would add. I think it was. I think I wrote it down here. It was like millions of dollars into the economy and create three thousand eight hundred jobs. So that's a start. Um, uh, one of the things that Senator Roth is not mentioning is that um, while while unemployment um, is very low, it only tells a very small part of the picture. Um, you guys may be familiar with the fact that 
37.5% of Wisconsinites are having trouble meeting basic needs. Um, I can speak to that because I am one of those Wisconsinites. This is a, a long word is asset limited, um, income constrained and employed, and that makes up nearly 40% of the people in Wisconsin. So we do need to take a look at raising the minimum wage so that people can, um, you know, I, I was talking to a gentleman at the doors. I said, wouldn't you rather people be able to pay their bills and pay for their child care and get to a job so they're not leaning on government services that you're so against? Uh, and he, he, even he agreed with that. Um, the other part of the question was, um, what would I do to, oh, the other thing that we need to do is make sure that we're getting people out uh, that are trained to work. Right now there is a waiting list for, um, for need-based financial aid, and there are people who want to go to the university or technical schools and be trained for jobs, and they just can't. Okay, thank you. Okay, kind of flows into that too, I guess. Um, this is for Lee first. The Wisconsin prison system is overcrowded and understaffed and spends more dollars than the entire University of Wisconsin system. What would be your approach to solving this problem? Yeah, I do believe that the criminal justice system in Wisconsin um, right now is, is not functioning as it should. Um, a couple of things that we can do. Um, we need to reduce the rate of recidivism. And um, I really applaud Outagamee County for the work that they're doing um, with, with courts that avoid getting people into the prison pipeline to begin with. Um, the drug courts, the veteran courts, mental health courts, um, which they are now paying for themselves because um, state dollars are no longer supporting that. So I think we need to look at alternative courts as one of the reasons, or one of the things we can do. Um, also, Wisconsin has one of the most um, punitive systems in terms of um, early release, um, release for good behavior. I think we need to take a look at compassionate release and Nobody, now, I mean, this is another thing that Democrats get attacked on. Nobody is talking about releasing violent people onto the streets. Okay, we're talking about people who have served their time, who are sick or elderly, and we are paying $40,000 a year to keep them in prison for no good reason. Um, I also think we, think we need to look at the core of a lot of these issues. A lot of the reasons that people commit crimes, um, often drug-related, are mental health issues. And we have a lack of mental health providers. We have a lack of funding for mental health um, um, uh, facilities that provide support for people. So I think we need to take a look at that, investing in that. And then I think we'll dramatically see a decrease in our prison population, and we will no longer see the, the ability or the, um, the need, as people are saying, for a new prison. Roger. Thank you. Uh, Speaker Paul Ryan in Washington is one of the few, uh, well, I guess I don't know how many, but he is a Republican that is working very closely uh, on this issue. I want to uh, step back to the state of Wisconsin. I want to thank, you know, over the last four years, almost quarterly, I have members of Esther and members of Wisdom who show up to my office and we have conversations. I see some of them over there. We have conversations regarding juvenile justice and criminal justice and the things that we can do to bring reform. And I think some of their suggestions uh, are, are worth mentioning. You know, state legislators, um, not necessarily, I don't know if I've ever had one of these, but a, a number of legislators, you know, you draw your bills and you want people to obey the law. And if they don't obey the law, the first thing they do is they put a line in there that says, if you don't, this will, you'll be, it'll be a class H felony or a class I felony. And I think we got to look at the, and you, as you all know, when you, get, when you get tagged with a felony, that stays with you forever. And I think we have, a, is, a, is a state perspective, we need to, to do serious looking when we're passing bills that have felonies associated with them. Yes, in certain instances you need them. Yes, I don't think anybody is talking about um, uh, letting violent criminals out, but I think there are things that we can do um, to make sure that you're not marked a criminal for your entire life, depending on the severity of what it is that you have there. And I think we have to look, if there are nonviolent uh, offenders in our prison systems, if there's a way that we can uh, make sure that they have their justice, but at the same point, find a way to, to get them back out into society, um, and to rehabilitate and to become productive members of our economy and so forth, that's a positive. That's a win-win for the state. We save a lot of money doing that, and it's better for the people. Okay, thank you. Should Wisconsin legalize medical marijuana? No. Wisconsin, uh, a number of states have done it. Uh, Wisconsin has not, and if I can just caveat to that, no, we should not legalize marijuana, particularly the way that Senator John Erpenbach's bill describes. Right now, the, what they're trying to do is bring medical marijuana as a stepping stone to the legalization of full marijuana. And I gotta tell you, our law enforcement is totally against it. 
Um, personally, I don't think we should be doing anything that encourages people to smoke anything. Now, here's a little caveat for you. I know of some, in fact, I was a supporter of a bill we passed in the legislature that dealt with cannabis oil. And the FDA just came out and in, in, um, put their stamp of approval on it. But what we find right now is that in certain instances, particular in young children with seizures, cannabis oil with a low THC content is actually helping them overcome as a remedy to those seizures. So if there's something we can do with like a cannabis oil, I've talked with folks, with elderly people who say they take cannabis oil, they're able to ru uh, rub it on their, on their joints. And again, this, this isn't a THC product, it's got a minimal amount of that, but they're able to rub it on their joints and they say that it, it helps take away the pain. So if there are things we can do to that extent, yes, but we should not legalize, uh, um, we sh especially when our law enforcement is again, and we don't have enough studies. So what should we do? We should let federalism work. There are a number of states that have it right now. We have the benefit now to learn from them and to have some honest studies some scientific studies go into the effects of smoking marijuana and how that contributes to people's bodies. And once we see that, we'd be in a better position to look at that issue. Thank you. Lee? To mimic Roger, yes, we should legalize um, medical marijuana. And I, this is a personal issue for me. Um, I have a father who is sitting right in my sight line right now. He is um, active treatment for cancer. And you guys may be aware that sometimes the, um, the, the side effects of being treated for cancer um, can be very compassionately treated with um, medical marijuana. I think we are in a situation where we need to find ways to compassionately offer symptom relief and pain relief from people who are sick and ill. And we can do it in a controlled way if we can legalize medical marijuana. That is something that can be another option. Um, at this point, um, I think the latest survey shows that most medical professionals do support the legalization of medical marijuana. I'm going to trust the doctors. I feel like they know more than I do about that issue. Um, and, if, and if they're supportive of that overall, I think that's something we need to explore. Um, additionally, um, there have been uh, situations where it has shown to reduce uh, an addiction to opioids. Um, it is one more way for people to get uh, non-addictive pain relief. And as you guys know, you know, right now in Wisconsin, as well as other communities, we are facing a terrible opioid epidemic. And if this would be one way to be able to uh, reduce the possibility of people being addicted to opioids, this is something that I would support. Thank you. Similar but not quite the same, tobacco. Annually, 2,600 Wisconsin kids become new daily smokers and nearly a third of Wisconsin high schoolers have tried e-cigarettes. The FDA recently labeled e-cigarette use among children an epidemic. Use of any non-cigarette tobacco product, including e-cigarettes, predicts smoking cigarettes a year later. What are some concrete steps the legislature can take to see these numbers decrease? And we'll start with you, Lee. Well, this is a new one for me, although I'm happy to say I listened to WPR the other morning and they were talking about it. Um, I would be supportive of um, making sure that um, people below a certain age were not able to smoke e-cigarettes or, or vaping. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm going to age myself. I don't know like all the terms and everything, but jewels and whatever. Um, so I think anything that is going to um, lead to future tobacco use is something that we should look at reducing, certainly. Um, I'm sure part of that is probably public education, educating students in school. I know that there's a, a robust program at the grade school level where um, students come in from middle school and high school and show them the impact of tobacco and smoking and things like that. So I certainly think that we can add that to it as well. Um, I, I think, again, we work with the, the, the Department of Health and we see you know, what, the, what the risks are and what we're seeing and we find ways um, to bring the right people to the table, um, the, the physicians, the people who are experiencing this firsthand, and, and ask the experts and see if we can come up with something that we can support on a bipartisan basis and do the right thing for Wisconsin. Thank you. Roger? I think we find that smoking, in, smoking trends in the United States among adults and children are falling, which is good. I think the public education uh, campaign uh, that we've just more or less seen over the last 20, 30 years, I think it's working. Um, I don't support uh, uh, minors smoking. I think that's, you know, I don't, uh, you're making a bad lifestyle choice there. Um, so I think we just need to continue in that, in that education mode. But I will tell you to, you know, to legalize marijuana and to somehow equivocate that smoke, and I'm, Lee's not doing this, but to equivocate smoking marijuana as being healthy and okay as opposed to tobacco, that's, 
That's not true. Early studies show that actually marijuana smoke might be three times more dangerous to your body than tobacco smoke. So I'm against smoking of all kinds. Uh, I'm against smoking of all kinds. I certainly re respect uh, adults having the ability to make those uh, informed choices for them, but we, continue, we need to continue to invest in education programs to make sure that kids recognize how dangerous this is. Thank you. Okay, climate change. At the University of Wisconsin, we have some of the best scientists in the country. Their position ma matches that of 97% of climate scientists around the world, that global warming is tied directly to the burning of fossil fuels. What is your preferred approach to solving climate change, and how can we best transition to a clean energy economy? Roger. Thank you. Best thing, right now, technology is doing this for us. So if you, look at our, if you look at our vehicles that we're driving, they're becoming more efficient. If you look at, um, now I would probably never drive a Tesla, maybe some of you do, but um, I think it's probably, well, I'm not gonna say. Uh, but electric, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, that makes economic sense in many cases, depending on your driving habits and needs. And the more that people are buying these and driving them, the more that the companies are uh, uh, working with them. I believe that Volkswagen is going to be, in fact, all of the major car companies, I believe by 2020, are going to have an all-electric vehicle option for people. That's how you do it. The free market works. People have their preferred habits and their, their preferred preferences. And I think that companies are waking up to what some of those are, and they're offering folks those choices. Um, I'll just throw this out there. As far as climate change is concerned, um, you know, I'm not a, 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 I'm not a believer. I do believe in climate change. Let me just say that. I believe that our climate is changing. I think our climate has been changing for thousands of years. They say 10 to 15,000 years ago we were in an ice age. Thank God the ice melted and we have the beautiful Wisconsin with all the lakes and rivers. We do have to be wise stewards of our environment, but I'm not going to squander the ability. You know, we have bigger problems, I think, right now in Wisconsin in taking care of making sure there's, in, it's okay, no. in taking care of investments in, our, in education, investments in our infrastructure, and I'm not really worried about 0.003% rise in global temperature 100 years from now. Lee, what would you have to say to that? I have a lot to say, but I only have uh, two minutes to do it. Um, so one of the things that I would point out is that very recently, the United Nations Intergovernmental Committee on Climate Change just released a study that showed in our lifetime, in 2040, we're going to see a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in um, the, the average temperature. Um, if you guys think hurricanes right now are bad, just wait till 2040. So it is definitely something that we can't, uh, we can't ignore and we can't pretend that we are not contributors to this. A um, Couple of things here. Um, yes, I think it's great to drive hybrid vehicles. I don't understand why we would make it more expensive to drive them in Wisconsin if climate change is a serious issue that we really want to do something about. Um, I think we need to invest in green energy. I think we have the ability to um, if you look at the return on investment for wind and solar power, it is insane. So if we're talking about an economic model that makes sense, let's invest in green energy. Let's invest in green business as a way to build jobs and build the economy here in Wisconsin uh, to help reduce that footprint as well. Um, I think another thing we could do is not provide, um, um, not push for EPA rollbacks of um, businesses and factories in southern part of Wisconsin. Um, we are seeing right now that um, Foxconn is going to be able to um, uh, put out more air, harmful air emissions than um, the Environmental Protection Agency um, thinks is right because of, because of a rollback there. So I think we need to make sure that we are taking stringent controls on air quality and what people are putting out there and keeping Wisconsin and the earth the place we know, love, and enjoy. Thank you, Lee. Um, back to you with this question about the environment then. Wisconsin's best asset is its great outdoors. I think somebody just said that. Do you think we are doing all we can to protect it? And if not, what changes would you propose? Well, I think I just answered part of that question. Um, no, we're not doing all that we can to protect it. Um, so uh, among the things that we can do is make sure, again, that we invest in, in green energy opportunities. I see it as a job builder, and I see it as a way to make sure that um, 
we are reducing our, our carbon footprint by uh, reducing emissions by finding alternative fuel sources. I do want to say, though, if you know, when we're moving away from fossil fuels, fossil fuels is an industry here that employs people. And we do need to have a transition program for people who are currently employed in that industry, um, getting them trained to work in other industries so that we're not just you know, abandoning the worker um, as we shift to uh, more responsible um, industries here in Wisconsin. Um, other things that I think I would do is um, you know, make sure that when we are um, bringing new businesses and industry into Wisconsin, that we're making sure that they adhere to standards um, so we can keep our air, water, and land clean. Uh, we don't want to see people um, dumping into rivers. Uh, and we also need to make sure that we actually keep our DNR filled with scientists. Um, our DNR has been gutted um, in recent years, and um, it's no longer an, um, uh, empowered as an agency to do um, what it used to do, which was to make um, educated, informed uh, decisions or, or information to, to the legislators so that they can make informed decisions. Um, and I think we need to get back that and we need to listen to the experts when it comes to science uh, and what's best for our planet here in Wisconsin. Roger. Thank you. One of the, are we doing enough, I think was the question. And I don't think you can ever answer that question, yes, but I, I think we are, we are continuing to do more, which I think is the important thing. One of the things that I've been working on with Representative Gary Talkin, uh, for those of you, it's not really an issue here in our area, but particularly in northeast Wisconsin, uh, the Door County Peninsula. You know, they got the, the karst features up there. The way, it wor the way they have it is they have bedrock just, in some instances, several inches to several feet below the soil. And what that means is, depending on um, part of it is through uh, manure spread from farmers, other parts are... Uh, from failing septic systems in the housing developments that live there, but the, the problem is that it's, it's contaminating the well water, and we saw the groundwater, and we saw what happened in Flint, Michigan. We certainly don't want to see that in, in the northeast Wisconsin. So we're working to see if we can, in working with the Public Service Commission, to see if we can put together a program. Digesters, I believe, here's another example we were talking about before, about how the free market can come and offer solutions here to our environment and to our climate. Digesters pose that uh, opportunity for us, and they're able to take um, the manure from, from these farms, from the, and, and you, if, we, if we're able to find a way to pipe it in, not only can we take this and have a clean source of energy with gas and electricity, but we can also, through reverse osmosis and through ultraviolet technology, we can clean the discharge of that water so it's actually cleaner than waters in the rivers and streams of that area. So that is something I'll continue to work on, in, if you certainly allow me to, in this next session. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Roger. Would you support a proposal to develop a nonpartisan process for drawing fair legislative district maps after the 2020 census? Thank you. And I know that I want to give a shout out to some of my friends over here, and there were others around who have met with me on this particular issue um, over the last uh, couple of sessions. And I know we don't necessarily always agree on everything. I will tell you this. If we're able to find a system in place that can implement what our Constitution directs us, which is to have con contiguous, compact, and districts that don't disparage for racial minorities, if we can do that in a system that we, other than the way we have it right now, I would certainly support looking at it. But every possibility and option that has been brought to me that we have looked at doesn't do that. Now, don't take my word for it. Yale did a study. Um, I actually know nothing. It seems like a nice school. That's why I say it. But Yale did a study in 2017, and they looked at the most, what they considered to be the most gerrymandered maps in the United States. And what they found was that the maps drawn by quote-unquote nonpartisan commissions were more gerrymandered than the, than the maps drawn by state legislators. So the positive thing about, so my point being that we don't have a fix yet for that. That being said, if we can have something that puts accountability, right now the way we draw maps, your legislator is accountable. If you have a nonpartisan commission, they're not accountable. So we want that accountability. We want to make sure that we follow our Constitution and nothing out there um, right now currently can do that, but I certainly am open if some solution can come forward. Thank you. Lee? Um, yes, I was actually just endorsed today by Eric Holder's group um, for um, nonpartisan redistricting. Um, I, frankly, am perfectly fine working for your votes rather than having maps being drawn so that your votes work in my favor. 
Um, I think that, I mean, it, it's national news. We are part of a lawsuit at the, at the Supreme Court. Wisconsin is one of the most politically gerrymandered states in the nation. And as much as I would like to say that if the Democrats were uh, in the majority that we would uh, redraw fair lines based on the 2020 census, as much as I would like to trust us uh, as a majority body, I'm not so sure that politicians after years of gerrymandering which have disenfranchised voters, um, I'm not so sure that I would even trust uh, our legislative body to do that. I would be in favor of an independent model, uh, nonpartisan, similar to the Iowa model. Um, what Senator Roth doesn't mention is, um, you know, they draw the maps and make a rep recommendation, but that legislative body then uh, votes to accept it or not. Um, and so it's not just what they say is, is you know, they're, it's not that they're not accountable, they certainly are. Um, their recommendations either go through or um, And I think it's, it's really, really important that we get back to a democracy that truly works and that your vote is counting um, and that maps are not drawn to protect certain seats or certain individuals in certain areas and we're not disenfranchising uh, everybody's voice. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that we are going to be civil and respectful tonight and not have any positive or negative reaction to the questions. Thank you. Um, this is on early childhood, and this goes to Lee first, right? I think so, yeah. Okay, right? Okay. Don't ask me to remember my early childhood. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that was so long ago. Okay. <laughs> Prominent economists have laid out the wisdom of funding early childhood initiatives, citing the return on investment ranging from $8 to $17 for every dollar spent. Investing in young children results in greater school success and graduation rates, lower rates of incarceration for youth, decrease in special education expenditures, lower teen pregnancy, higher employment rates with higher wages, decreased divorce rates. What will you do to promote wiser and more effective investment in our human infrastructure, our children? I love this question. Um, I get to bring another family member into my, my answer. My mother, who's sitting there, worked for years uh, for an organization in Green Bay called Healthy Families. And um, part of their work was working with families who are at risk for abuse and neglect. And um, part of the reason people are at risk is poverty. And so I, I know that Esther is working on an end child poverty movement um, which I have had the pleasure of meeting with them on and signing the pledge, and that's something I would certainly love to see. Uh, I also going to bring Girl Scouts into this. Um, Girl Scouts of the Northwestern Great Lakes serves um, 15,000 girls and 6,000 adult volunteers in 53 counties in Wisconsin. So although we're headquartered here in Appleton, um, we provide service to um, girls throughout Wisconsin and Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And we are fortunate enough that we have a research arm that shows us the direct impact of investing in young people, in our case, investing in girls. And, and you were right by what you read. When you invest in people when they are young, when you provide them with the tools and resources to be successful, when you make sure that they're not going to school hungry, when you're making sure that they are um, not in situations where they are safe or um, their health or their, or their safety is at risk, um, you are seeing positive outcomes. So again, if we, you know, there's a saying about you can tell uh, about a society by how it treats its youngest and its oldest. And I think we are at a point um, where we need to start investing in the very youngest of us so that we can once again show that we are a country that truly cares about our, country, our children and, and, and how they're growing up. Roger. Thank you. Uh, we, we absolutely need to, to make sure that we are educating our children even, even when they are, uh, before they enter our K-12 school system with our early childhood education. I say that to you not because I have four adorable children who are under the age of five, but because I can recognize in seeing them grow and develop how important that is. Now, I, over the last two and a half months, I was able to get my three-year-old, Oliver, I was able to work with him and he memorized the Gettysburg Address, the entire Gettysburg Address, and he just finished it this week, and I was able to do it with him, by the way, by just promising him an ice cream sundae from Culver's. Um, he's got to work on his negotiation skills. Um, but you can read, but I'm w putting that time and effort into him, but, but 
not every, you know, every family is different, every circumstance is different, and that's why to make sure that we have these programs available uh, so that our kids, even at that early three-year-old level, can have that opportunity to grow and expand their mind, that is so very important. And how do we do that? In the budget process, that is the process. The governor introduces his budget in, in February of every year, and we go through the joint finance process. That is where we make those priorities, which is, again, why it's so important at that time, if this is is an issue important to you to reach out to myself or other legislators and let them know so we can prioritize in the totality of our state budget. Thank you. Building on that and back to you, Roger, affordable, high quality child care is a critical contributor to the community's economy. Yet in our area and statewide, there is a critical shortage of child care staff. Administrators struggle to hire educated and experienced teachers. Centers are closing rooms at a time while parents struggle to find child care openings. Child care teachers cannot afford to stay in a field paying an average of $10 an hour. This might go back to that minimum wage thing, too. What will you do to address this critical shortage of child care staff in a time of record low unemployment rate? Yeah, well, child care, I mean, I get it. You know, I've got, I mentioned I got, you know, four adorable little children. And my wife, actually, she didn't want to, but it got to the point where after three children, um, we were actually losing money paying for daycare for the kids. By the time we got to four, I mean, we were hemorrhaging money. So it, we, one of us had to stay home with the kids, and she opted to do that, which I'm so thankful for. But I recognize the pressures that that puts on families. And I don't want, well, I think it's important, and she actually loves it right now, what she's doing and being able to work with the kids and so forth. But I want parents to be, to be able to make those choices, not be forced into those choices. Uh, the federal government, um, uh, the, actually the Trump administration, is working on, um, you might know Ivanka Trump, that's her, her main issue right now at the federal level, and I look forward to seeing what they, what they can come up with there, but, um, but we need to, I think, do everything we can to make sure that uh, at the state level we have quality child care. We did a number of things over the last decade to make sure that our child care centers, we have a rating system out there now. We want to make sure that when parents drop their kids off that that they know that they're going to be safe, that they have a certain amount of training and aptitude to take care of children. So that was an important first step. And we need to continue to look at that. Yeah, I want to make sure that, that parents can make those decisions and not be forced into them. Thank you. Well, I think this is, again, part of a broader economic discussion. Um, right now, um, child care is listed as one of the most um, uh, biggest stressors of, on in a family economy, being able to pay for child care. Um, right now, child care averages about $11,000 per child per household, and that is more than, I acutely know this, more than many, um, many uh, years of college tuition here in Wisconsin. Um, in terms of um, what can the state do about it, uh, if there's a shortage, um, you know, may, maybe the child care workers should talk to the place that's apparently paying $16 to wash dishes in the area. Um, I think that um, certainly making sure that we are um, paying them for, for the work that they're doing. I mean, essentially, we are handing over our children to them for the day, and they are keeping them um, happy and well and fed. And we just talked about what investing in children uh, does to, to their future and to our future um, when, when they grow up and work and, and live in our area. Um, so I think we do need to look at um, uh, uh, compensation for that. Um, how can we, um, and again, I don't, I don't have the answers. This would be a, another situation where I would say, let's take a look at the industry. Let's bring the people to the table to have the conversations who this is impacting the most and find a solution that works so that we can um, expand child care and affordable child care for everybody in Wisconsin who needs it. Okay, thank you. Um, and back to you, Lee. A special needs voucher covers 90% of a private school student's costs, but the state only covers 26% for public school students. How will you rectify this disparity? Where will the funding come from for the continued expansion of school vouchers without negatively impacting public schools? And do you, okay, this was several questions thrown together. You've probably picked up very on large. that already. Okay. And do you plan on changing how funds are distributed amongst the public schools and how would you redistribute them? 
Got all that? Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> I just, I'm just gonna take a broad sweep here. Um, right now in Wisconsin, we are definitely supporting two public school systems. One of them is not, <coughs> excuse me, one of them is not accountable to the, to the taxpayers. Um, the voucher school program, um, I, I'm for transparency. I think we as taxpayers should know um, when our tax dollars and the amount of our tax dollars that are going to voucher schools. Um, one of the issues that I have with voucher schools in particular is that uh, unlike a public school where you have a school board that you're accountable to, where you have specific standards that um, both the students are held to and their testing scores and the teachers are held to in their certification um, are not the same. And yet we are sending our tax dollars there for that. So I'm, I'm in favor of Tony Evers' plan. I, I think, you know, let's trust somebody that we as a state have consecutively elected um, as our superintendent of public instruction. Let's trust him as being somebody who can guide us through this difficult situation and make sure we get the school funding model back to where it needs to be. Um, I think we need to definitely take a look at that because you guys might not realize, but when, when Senator Roth and others are swearing on the, to uphold the Wisconsin state constitution, they are, are swearing to uh, provide access to quality, equal public education for every student in Wisconsin, whether they live in a rural area or an urban area, whether or not they have special needs or whether they or not they do not. So we do need to absolutely take a look at the funding model, and I think we need to mention of voucher schools at this point. It's taking too much away from our public school system, and we cannot no longer support that. Roger. Thank you. I support uh, I support the investments we've made in our K-12 schools over this last budget, an additional $640 million. I support voucher schools. I support right now in Wisconsin, if you make under 220% of the federal poverty level, we allow you to make the choice on, on where to send your child. I support charter schools. I support homeschoolers. My point is I support you, the parent, having the choice in where, in what school or what mode of education can best educate your child. And that's where I want to keep it. You know who's the best determinant for what, is, for what school or what mode of, thing, of, of, of uh, learning works best for the child? It's the parent. And how do the parents feel? Uh, you'll see right now that in our... Um, uh, in our part of the state, there are uh, several hundred, probably around 400 parents who've made the decision to put, use the voucher program. There are about 1,000 parents who have made the decision to use open enrollment, which is the voucher program for public schools. So we need to have choice and opportunity and give that to parents. That's, I think, where it belongs. If you look at what we've done, we've been able to do that in investing not only in our K-12 schools, but also in all the other forms of education. Let parents make the choice. I will always stand in more choice and more opportunity for parents and students. Okay. So we did preschool, essentially, and then we did regular school. Now we're going on to college, okay? We're moving right along here. The state share of UW fu budget funding has declined from 24% in 2007 to 17% in 2017. Should state funding for the UW system budget increase? Should the tuition freeze be lifted? And how can the combination of freezing UW tuition without refilling the state funding, but instead continuing to cut funding, maintain the quality and offerings of the UW system? Okay. Um, gosh, that was a lot. Let me, uh, I support the tuition freeze. Let's start there. Nothing does more to help parents and help students understand the fixed costs of education than having a tuition freeze. I don't think anyone's done more over the last eight years to bring college affordability to the college student than a tuition freeze. So I support extending that for another two years. The legislature cut money from the UW system um, in uh, uh, two budgets ago, and the reason they did it is because they found an over $300 million slush fund in the University of Madison. And let me, you know, I was just reading a story uh, from Kentucky uh, about a university in Kentucky last night. And this was a university that hasn't charged tuition since the 1920s. And they were able to do it because they had some wealthy benefactors who set money aside, but they said that you couldn't spend the principal and you could only use the interest and it had to go to paying for tuition. So now all they have between 1,500 and 2,000 students. They have an endowment of $1.5 billion and they don't get charged, the students don't get charged a dime. 
So if they can do that on a $1.5 billion endowment, I'm surprised that Harvard with a $39 billion endowment can't do the same thing. And even our schools here in the UW system with Madison, I think that there are, there are ways that we can bring affordability to, to the students, and I think they ought to start looking at that. And um, so yeah, thank you. Okay, Lee, on to you. Um, <clears throat> well, I think that the tuition freeze sounds like a great thing, um, but it only works if you are backfilling with um, other revenue. So what happens when you freeze the tuition and your expenses still increase is that you need to make cuts elsewhere. And what we're finding is that those cuts are coming at the expense of our students. And when we are working, when we are living in an environment where there is a worker shortage, I think we should make it easier for students to graduate on time and with the right degree and the skills that they want in there for. So, you know, what we're seeing now is that with the elimination of certain classes or certain majors or certain teachers who are no longer there to have as many sessions as you might need to graduate. I have a daughter in college right now, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty close to this issue. Um, it takes longer to graduate. So are you saving money if you graduate in four and a half years or five years just because there's a tuition freeze? So like I said, I think it's a, it's a feel-good measure. It's something that I think the, the governor likes to, to campaign on as a way that he thinks he's helping. Um, and what Senator Roth did not mention is we really do need to look at the cost of student loan debt. Um, if we want to have, again, an economy that is robust, we need to have um, young people who are graduating with the ability to contribute to that economy. And when they have a student loan payment of $500, $1,000 a month, the average Wisconsinite is graduating now with $30,000 in debt. So when we have them in a situation where they are so deeply in debt and you want to get your rent paid for and your student loan and your food, you're not buying a car and you're not buying a house and you certainly aren't going out to dinner and, and purchasing things. So we are in a situation where we are basically creating a, a suppressed economy because student loan debt cannot be refinanced in the state. Thank you. As the parent of two college students in the past, I totally hear you. Um, gun violence. What's your plan to reduce it in Wisconsin? Um, I think that we need to start with where everybody agrees. And when you look at gun owners, the majority of gun owners at this point support mandatory background checks for everybody. I don't care if you're buying a gun privately. I don't, buy, don't care if you're buy, buying it at, a, at a, a, a gun gun show or you're buying it at, a, at an arms dealer. You need to have a background check. Um, we give people uh, a test and um, make sure that they know how to drive when they get a driver's license, which of course can be a deadly weapon if you wanted to. We need to at the very least do the same for, for firearms. I do support the Second Amendment rights. I'm not here to take away anybody's guns. Um, I, think hunt, I think hunting in Wisconsin is certainly something um, that we want to make sure everybody has a, a right to do if that's something they want to do. I think the other thing that we need to do is have a 48 hour waiting period. If you cannot wait 48 hours for a gun that you do not own, there's probably a situation there that, that um, is dangerous, whether or not self-harm to yourself, uh, mental illness, or potential violence to somebody else. So most gun owners agree on that. Can, can we just start with where we agree? You know, the 48-hour the waiting period uh, and the mandatory background checks. And I think that's where we start the conversation. I think the reason that people on both sides are afraid to have this conversation is because it always escalates to, well, what next? Well, what next? Well, what next? Well, we don't have time for what next when we have students being going to school and being massacred or people going to concerts or church and being massacred because we do not have the, um, the protections, the gun violence protections uh, that we need in this country. Roger. I'm an avid sportsman and hunter, but yet I recognize that, that our rights come with responsibilities. And there, there was a bill uh, before the legislature that right now, in fact, in Wisconsin, uh, you can conceal and carry a firearm, but you have to take proficiency training to do that. There was a bill in the legislature that would remove that proficiency. Well, I certainly don't support that. I think it's important that, that when we exercise our rights when it comes to, say, concealed carry permit or even with hunter safety, that we go through a certain amount of proficiency to make sure that you actually know how to handle a firearm. I mean, maybe 100 years ago when everyone grew up on farms and they were around guns their entire lives, maybe that sort of bio, you just sort of grew up and learned it um, that way, but that's not the case today. And that's why I wouldn't support something like that. Um, you know, I'm a, uh, I've got training, not extensive training, but I've got training through the military uh, in handling of firearms. And I can tell you, you know, it, it worries me um, when we, 
you know, if we were to say remove the proficiency training for concealed carry, because you know, I, I'm all in favor of people concealed carrying, but I also know that you have to understand exactly the pressures that you're going to face in a situation. If you had, God forbid, an active shooter situation, you'd have to, in a split second, know exactly what to do and what would happen with law enforcement. We had an issue happen not too long ago where someone was actually <laughs> shot because they didn't know in the active shooter situation. The police just assume every, anyone with a gun is probably the active shooter. So we need to have those responsible measures in place, um, and that's why I wouldn't support uh, that bill that's currently before the legislature, and I certainly support proficiency training for people handling firearms. Okay, let's just expound on that a little bit. Um, let's give them each one minute for this one. I didn't hear you address anything about other than proficiency, Roger. Did you have anything you wanted to say about well, else? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's there's many things we can do on the background checks, for instance. You know, the the vast majority of firearms that are sold in our country are sold uh, through. If, if you were to go to a store, or whatever, and the background check is done on it, or it's by a licensed dealer, uh, where they have to call in and get a background check done on it. The one area where we don't have that is private gun sales, and then and then um, uh, uh, gun shows. And I think that in 2018, there's, so I've actually initiated the process in working out with the Department of Justice. There's gotta be a way that we can offer a program at the state level for gun shows that happen within the state of Wisconsin, where we can have the Department of Justice show up to the to gun offer to do the background checks or to do the background checks for the firearms that are being transacted at that location. I think that would be a reasonable and responsible first step in the process. Thank you. Lee, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I think I would like to add that um, you'll, oftentimes when, um, particularly Republicans are asked about this question, they will always talk about um, you know, safe, school safety or safety grants, et cetera. So obviously Wisconsin um, schools, were some of them were recipients of that. Um, that does not address the core issue. We're, nobody's gonna argue that we don't want our schools to be safe, of course. Um, that particular um, grant in Wisconsin was a Band-Aid. It's not sustainable. Yes, it has some mental health training, but what happens when people, you know, when, when new staff come in and there's no longer the money for that? I did meet with the, um, the various superintendents in the district and asked them how they felt about that safety grant and, um, and, and if they had any if it positive or negative concerns about it. You know, and there are provisions in there. In Menasha, for instance, you know, great, it gives them security cameras, but they don't have the money to staff somebody to watch these security cameras. So a lot of these are just sort of Band-Aid measures that make uh, you know, Republicans feel good about thinking they're addressing um, the gun violence crisis, um, but are certainly not getting to the heart of the issue. Okay, thank you. And thank you for all your thoughts on everything. Um, now I'd like to give you each um, one to two minutes to make a closing statement. This time we'll begin with Lee. That went fast. Uh, maybe, maybe not for you guys, but it did for us. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, very much again to the League of Women Voters for having um, both Senator Roth and I here tonight, and thank you to everybody who took time out of your day. Um, I'm in a very unique position as somebody who is running against a longtime um, uh, politician who's an incumbent. Um, when, when Roger is talking, you can look to his record. You can look to legislation that he's authored, you can look to votes that he's taken, and you can use that as your proof of um, where his values lie, if his votes have aligned with the things that he, had, that he has said tonight. Um, in my situation, uh, you have to do something kind of scary, which is, which is about trust and, and perhaps even taking a risk. And I hope that what you have seen tonight um, by the answers that I've given you and the little bit that you may have learned about me um, is, is that I am an authentic candidate. I am truly somebody who is one of you. I am struggling with many of the same things that you are struggling with. And I have been raised uh, with certain values, have raised my children with certain values, and certainly in my, in my job have, have um, exhibited those values um, at the Girl Scouts. Um, the Girl Scouts has a promise and a law, um, and I look at that every day at my desk as a way of guiding the work that I do there. And that certainly translates into the way I would govern. Um, 
part of part of what I want to commit to you is that I truly would be bipartisan. I think a lot of people right now who have been in, in Madison for a long time have gotten to an, a point where they are uh, beholden to their caucus and they are reluctant to, to do things that um, may have had bipartisan support, but because it did not have, uh, uh, it did not go in a win column for their particular party that they have not put legislation through. Um, Senator Roth has talked a lot about being an independent voice. Um, if you look at his voting record, he has voted 98% of the time um, with Fitzgerald. So I, I think I would probably redefine independence um, if I was able to get in the Senate. Um, I've never done this before, and, and I just want to you know, do the right thing for the people in this district, uh, make sure that I'm representing you and your interest, and not be beholding to anybody um, but the voters here. And I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Roger? Thank you. I've appreciated the opportunity to converse with you all this evening. I could tell by some of the response out there that I'm really making some headway. So I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I think, when we started that, that uh, I'm a third generation home builder, born and raised in this area. I learned from my dad all really the values of life and the meaning of hard work. But when we were out on those job sites, there's a rule in the construction trades. And the most senior person on the job site gets to pick the radio station. And that was always my dad. And we always listened to, for some, some of you might remember, 1280 WNAM, the greatest hits from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, at least at that time. One of the songs I probably heard 100 times, um, and once I say it, you're not going to get out of your head for a couple of days, but it went something like this. For everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn. A time for every purpose, under heaven. Now, I don't know why I've been thinking about that song over the last couple of days, but if I were to add a couple of phrases to that, I would say that there is a time to campaign and there is a time to come together. There is a time to resist and there is a time to embrace. And there is a time for political discourse and there is a time for national healing. And friends, when we look out at our country today, can we at least agree that we need some national healing? And I think that can't begin anywhere but right here with us. And that's why I'd like to ask all of you, whether you support me or you support Lee, whether you're going to vote for me or you're going to vote for Lee, when this election is over, can we come together as one people again, respect the outcome of the election, listen and learn from one another, and make this state a better place. Can you help me with that, I ask? Thank you. Thank you, Roger. This concludes this forum for State Senate District 19. Just a few reminders. The election is Tuesday, November 6th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and you may register when you go to vote on Election Day. Proof of residency is required. You must also show a voter ID in order to vote a photo voter ID. Um, thanks to all the team who put this together. Thank you especially to our candidates. Our democracy. <laughs> our democracy depends on citizen involvement. Because you're here, I suspect you already know this. Your vote is your voice in our democracy. Please exercise your right and let your voice be heard. Thank you for coming.